What's up guys? I'm Major Man and in today's video we're gonna be reacting to South Sudan. I'm quite excited to film this because it is one of Geography's now latest episodes. Not to mention the fact that it's a new country that I mean started in like 2011. But I'm, I think they only got just got their independence. I don't know. Uh, comment below if you guys have more information on this. Um, thank you guys for watching my videos. Uh, no, 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 wait, this is not the end of the video. Uh, if you are new to the channel, please drop down and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss a new upload. I upload every week, so stick around. Make sure to like this video so I can carry on and making new videos and people can see my content. So what do I know of South Sudan? At the moment, nothing. I know a little bit about Sudan because I've watched the Geography Now Sudan video, but so I have no idea what to expect. Seriously. <laughs> so let's get started right now. Well, this is it. Now that the Sudan episode has been done, we reach our last and final twin country. Born in 2011, this is the newest country on earth. It all begins with some very tall people in a very large swamp. It's, it's time to learn geography. geography now! Let's go! Everybody get a Geography Now mug at geographynow.com. Oh, pretty cool, man. out if it's your merch. Oh, and uh, speaking of which, these shirts are made from unityshirtshop.com. Rubas, isn't it? Ruba from the Sudan yes! episode for me. They look pretty cool! Like one of these. Design and everything! Africa! Come on. Now, South Sudan is not your typical African country. Everything from the physical makeup of the land to the people are completely distinguishable. And speaking of people, as you know, one thing we love to do on this show is have people from the country in the country episode. Oh, so snap! They actually have people as well now! Tapes. Akan and Yamal. Akan and Yamal. Great. <laughs> what are some things you think absolutely that everybody South must Sudanese. know about South Sudan? Very quickly, awesome. what do you think? Well, South Sudan is home of the most melanated. Melanated, that's a big word for me. The food, mm -hmm. great, natural. Mm -hmm. huh. Amazing. There's so much oh, we gotta God. cover in this episode, right? Yes. yes. So much. Oh my God. All right, well, let's do it. Let's do it. Ah! So as the newest country, the sign of political story, come on, man. And borders had to be established. But even then, things still got a little... I love the way Nima is like talking. She's like First talking as if there's some story, you know, like a proper... Central Africa, <sighs> surrounded by six other countries, and has oh, three disputed countries. areas That's and it. one condominium. The first dispute lies within the coffee. I feel sorry for them, but technically feel like they on paper according to have the a swamp, so they already they have like... Sudanese. Sudanese forces are still mostly in control as oh, it acts no. as a biosphere reserve for the Radom National Park. Fun fact, Warlord Joseph Kony is speculated to be hiding here. Moving oh, on, the border with really? Uganda also has some border dilemmas, especially around the town of Moyo. Historically, the borders were never really properly demarcated, so they just kind of left it up to the peoples in the area to figure it out. Finally, they have well, the I thought that. Long story short, they let me try and go. What is like the breach of version of is under de facto Bermuda control, control, but claimed by South Sudan as it had to do with confusing borders that were drawn and redrawn during British imperial years. If South Sudan were to come into control of this area, it would give them the most narrowest path passage only a few meters wide to Lake Turkana, but alas, oh. Kenya has de facto control. Otherwise, they, oh, they would have control. Sudan, which means both countries have only control got that as a green control pro after independence. Moving on, the country is divided into 10 states, two administrative areas, and of Some course, say, the yeah. special administrative area of Abye. Oh, this state is called Unity and this one's called Lakes. The two <laughs> administrative areas are Pibor and Ruwang, which act as zones that sure have a slightly different right. status due to various compromises made with inhabiting ethnic groups. In any case, the capital and largest city is Juba, located in the southern part of the country. Here you can also find the largest and busiest airport, Juba International, which serves as the main hub for any foreign visits to the country. From there, the second largest city would be Bor, located about 100 miles oh, or wow. 160 kilometers north of Juba in the Jongle state. However, the second busiest airport is actually located in the fifth largest city, Malakal, located in the north and eastern Nile state. With the exception of the inner city roads and one highway between Juba and Nimule on the border with Uganda, what nearly all all the rest of the roads of South Sudan are unpaved gravel no roads. No way! Finally, the country has only one railway so that connects them to Sudan from the city of Wau in the northwest to the city of Bamnusa in Sudan. The line was heavily Ooh, destroyed during no. the civil war, but rehabilitated with UN funds and reopened yes. in 2010. Keep in mind, the states are often bunched into three historical provinces that many people might refer to if you ask them. They are Barkazal, Equatoria, and Greater Upper Nile. Also, Juba isn't even that old. It actually started as a trading post made by Greek settlers in the 1920s. And speaking of condominiums, South Sudan used to belong to the largest one ever made, the Anglo-Egyptian condominium. In fact, South Sudan was kind of triple colonized. It was like... 
Look, Egypt, technically run by an Albanian guy under the Ottoman Empire. You and I are both powerful people. Let's say we team up and we control pretty much the whole Nile. Okay, so we're not part of the British anymore, but I'm still in charge of you. Okay, I'm not part of Egypt anymore, but I'm still in charge of you. Okay, we had two civil wars after giving you autonomy. Clearly, we can't stick as one. Here's your independence. Yeah. What South Sudan have had is so hard. Three whole what? revolutions kind of thing. An incredibly condensed version, but yeah, triple colonized. You get, you get the point. Triple colonized! South Sudan is that even though cities are growing, they still have one of the most rural, dispersed populations on Earth. So obviously, due to this interesting layout, getting around in South Sudan is quite different from most places. For example, they have like an app that's kind of like Uber. It's called Shilu Ana. Um, what do you guys know about getting around in South Sudan? Like, I visited a couple years ago. There's no like direct way or direct direction of how to get around every man for themselves. Every, every man for themselves in driving. Like no Google Maps. That's the cool. We can't forget Nasser. That is the city where my family is from, my parents. So shout out to Nasser. Ooh, whoops, Nasser. New era. So if you want to learn about the new air people. Oh, and uh, Akan, you said something about hotels in South Sudan. What, what was it about? So when I went to South Sudan, I realized that a lot of people lived in um, hotels and those are people that had the means, the money. Um, otherwise, people lived in like huts and places with no electricity. So it's kind of like, if you got the money, you go for a hotel. Exactly. In addition, there's so many cool nature spots of South Sudan and that just, uh, I guess that brings us on to the next segment. The... Yes, we go to little draw repeat. Let's start. On the poorest countries, ah. and yes, statistically, the majority of the population, especially in rural areas, don't have regular access to certain utilities. But the funny thing is, by all means, it's a nation with lots of potential to flourish, but it's just you know, the political atmosphere always kind of gets in the way. The politicians, everything just... Uh, yeah. 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 The, good hey, is, the dust is now just starting to settle. And there's a lot of promising recovery work happening. First, let's explain the physical layout. Now, from the globe, you can tell that South Sudan's domain lies just below the Sahara in the beginning of the lush green belt of Africa. This they're lucky they're not in the Sahara. The is lush, with tropical grasslands and savannas and forests. This is partially due to the Ironstone Plateau on the west side of the country, a slightly elevated region about 800 to a thousand meters above sea level that gets copious so amounts of rain really that green. inevitably flush into the Barkazal region. The only places of noticeable arid landscape would be the far north upper Nile salient area on the border with Sudan and the far southeastern corner on the Alemi Triangle with Kenya and Ethiopia. All the lush greenery is fed by the longest and most important river of the nation, the White Nile. The thing is, the White Nile isn't even easily traceable due to the fact that it feeds through the largest freshwater wetland in the Nile Basin, the massive and famous Sud. At some point, past the town of Malakal, the White Nile just kind of thins out and flattens into all the ironstone plateau runoff, creating an incredibly massive swamp with an impossibly complicated maze of disjointed tributaries that sometimes dead end, dry up, or cut off into oxbow lake. Hey, look, there's a meander. Its name from the Sud, being Arabic for barrier or obstruction. In ancient times, the Egyptians couldn't get past this maze and neither could the Romans. Many sources will just <laughs> claim that the Sud swamp is considered the largest inland body of water in itself, since it's too difficult to measure the constantly fluctuating levels of water in dry and wet seasons. However, I kind of wanted to be a little bit more thorough and see if there were any actual lakes of substantial volume, and I believe this one, near the 7 degree latitude, 30 degree longitude line, near the village of Genglil, is the largest of all the river lakes. I love the way he's giving the coordinates rather than saying anything specific. It's just literally... The Imatong Mountains near Uganda, and it is also here where you can find the tallest peak of the nation, Mount Kinyeti, at about 3,200 meters high. Yeah, water is almost overly abundant in South Sudan and the people here are kind of flood experts. For example, in some places like Awil, the capital of Barca Abundant water, that's good! Seasonally, as people move back and forth between where the there's water, there's life. Season to and season. where there's life, and then they move back to the city. Yeah, it's a good time, a chance of now recovery. For even more down. interesting. <laughs> South Sudan is actually very rich in oil. See, South Sudan actually <laughs> ranks third in oil reserves in sub Saharan. Oh, snap, they got a lot of oil. Part of the country. Here, the potential to produce 3.5 billion barrels annually exists. However, only about 10% of it is tapped. Hey, you destroyed some of the oil fields in the Civil War, like Block 5. And then 
then you suspended us from using your oil pipes in 2012. Yeah, but then I reopened them because clearly you need my port for global trade and my refineries because you don't have any. <laughs> Not for long. I'm building two refineries. Then hopefully I can ditch you for the lap set project. Wait. Uh, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you little yeah, as of 2021, the Ministry of Petroleum started their first rounds of investment bidding for oil licensing. And currently they are trying to invest in connecting a pipeline to Lamu port in Kenya. But it will take some time and it has to work out perfectly. Nonetheless, much of the economic progress was hindered in the decade following independence. For now, South Sudan... Ah, uh, no, this last 10 years must have been tricky the then. ...underdeveloped economies with the highest aid dependency on Earth. They even import much of their food from neighboring Uganda and Kenya, which is weird because the World Food program estimates that about 90% of their country is arable, yet only about 5% is cultivated. Regardless of the low GDP statistics, really they don't seem to have many problems with food insecurity. Due to the highly fertile land, most people have access to their own subsistence crops, and they have- oh, That's good then. Farming is just the way to go. In the world. In fact, there are more cattle in the country than people. Speaking of cattle, cattle let's move on to the no wildlife way. section with Gary Harlow to explain. Hey everybody, so yeah, Caleb aka Gary Harlow was gonna film this, but No Gary Harlow as we speak. So I'm gonna fill in. Six national parks, eleven nature reserves, all taking up about no! Oh, density of human population, they have these. Come on, you say like Gary Harlow. Earth, about 900 species of birds can be found here, including the unique looking. Come on, Bob's do some justice to Gary Harlow's. But if you're lucky, you can see the national animal, the African fish eagle. South Sudan is a refuge for some incredibly rare species, such oh, as the Revi's zebra, the largest of all the zebras, and the African wild dog. Of course, with lots of rivers and water bodies, you can find lots of fish, such as the bichir fish. It's a lungfish. It can partially breathe on land and crawl up with its pectorals. <laughs> in fact, it's often said that fish in South Sudan live long and die old because people don't eat fish that much in South Sudan. They're more focused on livestock. You could potentially catch a huge tilapia, perch, or catfish like the size of you in their rivers or waters. So that's pretty much all I got here. Uh, Caleb, can't wait to see your kid. Have a good one. Well, well congratulations to Gary Harlow with his kids as well. We could. I wonder like, why. That's really but focus on I miss him. Kind of you guys love your livestock, you, but you have so much fish. <laughs> Go more fishing. Go fishing more. <laughs> Can't swim. Akon. 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 Well, regardless, South Sudan definitely has an amazing food scene that is very underrated. To explain more, here's Langfala. To be honest, we have a lot Hello, of cuisines, but let me just pick some of them. We have Asida, Asida. and we have a Kisra mm, that Kisra? was inherited from the north. We have Manyakelo, we mm. have a Kop, we Ooh. have Walawal. And the good thing of Walawal, you use it with Tung coming to uh, oh, this, you have to use it with Tung. There is a Gwede Gwede, there is some Agarubu too. Oh, that looks like a meal. That like a Janga Janga, and also breweries is part of our life. We do have a Kwete, Ooh, we have Kenyimur, we have if you know We love food. We offer food to you when you come to us. We eat when we are at the funeral. Look at his smile. I love it. He's yeah. such a happy if, guy. If you have an event without food, nobody's going to like speak good about it. Thank you, Langfala. <laughs> Fun fact, if you order a combo with a drink and fries, you'll get a combo combo. <laughs> combo combo. <laughs> no, you have to like literally slap him. Actually, slap him? Yes, yes. Yeah, slap him. Oh. Your mom's best dish that she can make. Go. Cook. Ooh. Easily. Cook. Go. Um, The best that I would choose this Mula Kudra and people come together. Oh, the Mula like, Kudra. She, she met, uh, the, the when you eat. They mentioned right. that before, didn't they? Weird to eat alone. Like, yes. <laughs> if you're cooking, you have to cook for everybody in the house. Yes. In any case, like the food, the people of South Sudan come in so many different groups and styles. Let's talk about that now in. All right, so Yamal, Akan, what do you think it means to be South Sudanese? Ooh, what is a, tough a South Sudanese person? Knowing a lot about yourself and naturally we're very yeah. spiritual people. So we believe in the power of your words. We believe in community. We believe in family. And adding on to what Yamal said, um, being South Sudanese means that you have like an ambition mm -hmm. to be something greater than the place that you come from. Oh, uh, passion people South can feel the fire inside them. <laughs> well, okay, so within South Sudan, there are tons of tribes and clans and ethnic groups. The vast majority, though, belong to one of the most distinct people groups on the planet, the Nilotes. We'll talk about them in a bit, but first, 
the graph. First of all, the country has a population Ooh, of about 11 million people with over 60 tribes or ethnic groups, and about half of the population is 18 or under. Within these various groups, the vast majority at over 90%, some say up to 95%, are of the Nilotic branch, whereas the remaining population is mostly Niger-Congo groups, sometimes falling under the alternate Bantu title. Within these groups, a few stick out as the larger, more predominant communities. The Dinka are the largest at somewhere around 35% of the population, next being the Nuer at about 16%. And from there, it's kind of debatable on which one comes in third, Nilotic as statistical data is usually basic. difficult to get exact estimates. But each of the three tribes, the Shiluk, Bari, and the Niger-Congo Bantu group, the Azande, That's a very complex graph! That is so complex! About 5% each. From there, the rest of the population is made up of the remaining 55 or so tribal and ethnic I can imagine groups. him going even deeper than that then. Thousand, Having a less than sub sub circle. We use the South Sudanese pound as our currency, and we use the Type C and D outlet. We also drive on the right side of the road. The official language of the country mm. is English. However, of course, most people use the mother tongue of their tribe or ethnic group first. Keep in mind, though, due to the influence of Sudan oh, when they're under Sudan, some people, mostly in Juba, still speak a dialect of Arabic called Juba Arabic, which is kind of like a mix between Arabic, English, Turkish, and native words from various tribes. There is no single type of South Sudanese person. However, as we explained, the vast majority are Nilotic peoples. We've talked about these people yeah, the before in previous episodes, but... Recap. But then they have some sub sub peoples or Nilots, in short, are some of the most distinguishable individuals, not just in Africa, but the whole world. For one, due to our genetics, many have very commonly noticeable features, such as long, slender, ethnomorphic physiques, long limbs, they look cool. pigments. They look like over six feet. <laughs> and height in the world. Okay, I'm standing right next to you guys. That's us. This yeah. is literally, this is the height range. So clearly Nimal is the tallest. Supermodel. Period. <laughs> Period. <laughs> That's right. After Dutch males, Nilotic men are considered the tallest people on earth and specifically the Dinka and Shiluk peoples averaging at about 181 to 182 centimeters respectively. The ah! men are the tallest. Our men. <laughs> the way you said that. Anywha, faith-wise, almost two-thirds of the country are Christian, with about 30% adhering to traditional African beliefs like animism, and the remaining population is mostly Muslim. Now, considering how the majority of the country is Nilotic and non-Muslim, you might kind of pick up on the hints that played into the Civil War when they were under Sud Sudan's rule in the north. Let's have geography a catch explain. So basically what happened was that, you know, Sudan and South Sudan, they're really two different lands. They're different every single way in terms of land, in terms of religion, in terms of culture, in terms of the people in general. As you know, in Sudan, people are a mix of Africans and Arabs, and in South Sudan, people are mostly just Africans. And then when Egypt colonizes, and then when Great Britain colonized us, it seems like they forced two different lands together. And then not only that is when they left, they also put most of the control of Sudan uh, to people from the north who in turn discriminated against people from the south. That is when they started rising up in the first war and there was about half a million deaths as a result of the war. But the war that most people know about between the north and the south was the second Sudanese civil war. That war cost approximately three million lives and that uh, war has been lives. led mostly by John Gray. Oh, He's no. a famous figure throughout all of Sudan. During that war atrocities were committed by both sides on a massive scale. And not only that, it wasn't only just the South fighting the North, but it was tribes within the South fighting each other at that time while we were also fighting against Sudan. And I guess that's what also led to the bitterness between North and South Sudan. That's what also led to the bitterness between all the tribes in South Sudan. I'd say one thing that every single family in South Sudan has in common is that they all have lost somebody in that war against the North. It's a lot of people lost their lives at that war. Thank you, Akech. Then in 2013, there was an internal war. In a nutshell, it went like... Oh, you are totally gonna coup to me. Well, yes, I usually wear a cowboy hat in public. George W. Bush got me into this trend. Oh, that's crazy. I was totally not gonna coup to ta you. Oh, oh, oh. This is kind of stupid. I'm so tired. 400,000 people killed and a third of my country displaced. We're better than this. We need to stop. Peace deal? Yeah. yeah okay, peace Let's deal. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of margaritas. <laughs> And from there, a national unity government was established, giving representation to all political factions. In any case, yeah, the guy wears a cowboy hat. What's the time for some reason? Did you see that picture? <laughs> with extreme tribal and ethnic group diversity. Even within the Dinka group, there are like 25 sub-clans. And you probably know more about that because you're part Dinka. Yep. What hey. type of Dinka are you? So I'm Dinka and I'm from the Mok Lol Yak. And you're also part Shiluk. Part Shiluk. So yeah. you're new where, but 
what part of Nowhere are you? Well, I'm Nowhere, but I failed to mention that my dad's mom is Dinka, mm. and she's Dinka Bur. So I'm Gajok, so I'm Nowhere, and I'm from the Gajok tribe within the Nowhere. What is it like when you meet other Nowhere people or you meet other Dinka or Shiluk people? I mean, it's like we connect in ways that are, you know, beyond such like a tight-knit community. Um, for me, like, I think it's awesome when I run across a person that speaks the same language as I speak so that I keep that language, you know, I remember yeah. that language always. Yeah, especially like also me identifying as Noor, but yeah. also having Dinka. I'm Dinka and I'm mixed with Shilunk. I think that's a blessing though, you got two different worlds in you. I'm half Korean, half European. And we're all Americans. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously we don't have time to discuss all the groups oh, and their traditions that would take way too long. But to summarize in the broadest terms, most South Sudanese people can be culturally divided into the three regions that we discussed earlier. Barakazal come from Arabic meaning the Sea of Barakazal. That's an interesting name. The largest group, the Dinka, as well as other Nilotic groups. This area is predominantly made of shrubland, which makes it perfect for cattle. Man, gazelles, fair play. Part in the people culture here. Then you have the greater Upper Nile. This is the largest wetland area, seasonally flooded with oh, marshes wow, and was... river tributaries. This is home to most. He's got a nice boat. As well as some of the Dinka and other tribes like the Shiluk and Nyuak. I wonder how they make that. For those the Shiluk and Nyuak are actually famous for having kingdoms that formed centuries ago. Finally, you have the Equatoria, the southern part of the country. This is the agriculture zone where most of the produce comes from. It's also home to the most ethnically diverse region in the country. Wow, that's a lot of tribes. Here you find dozens of tribes and clans like the Badi, Mandari, Toposa, and the largest non nilotic tribe. The Azande. All right, so what are some things about the South Sudanese culture and things that you've taken notes of from your understanding? How would you go about it? What would you say? Because marriage is such a beautiful thing. It's huge in our culture. But another yes, thing marriage is huge in every culture, right? Is our ghost marriage. Wait, ghost marriages? Yes. When a girl or a boy pass away young, a family member can have can get married and have children on behalf of the deceased. And this happens commonly throughout many different tribes, right? Different right. tribes. It's Nuer Dinka. What? I tribe also children on behalf of different types of scarring what? that are done by needle. Mm -hmm. And in Nuer, um, the forehead scars that go over the forehead that are, are like lines, it's called God. And there are dots, and that's beef. You know, it's completely normal and it's respected in the culture. Did you ever have some really nice distinguish yes, like what tribe you're from. Everybody has a story in South Sudan. Right. Two cool huts. They're very popular. They're made of mud and they last about 20 years. You'll find them very often in South Sudan. Apparently, a lot of girls play boru boru. It's uh, basically a dodge. Oh, I like dodge ball boru. I, I like to play four girls on every side of one girl in the middle, and they just. Oh wait, so one girl in the middle is just only. Wow. And speaking of sports, let's go to art with the sports part. Art with the sports part. Hey guys, I'm on daddy duty. This is awkward. Wait, what? Let's he has a kid in the show. in South Sudan. All right. One of the favorite pastimes at the tribe. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> He's distracting me. Just play over here. One of the most favorite pastimes I don't know how he people thought he could do his job, boss. is wrestling. Take it's mostly care. practiced though by the Dinka, Mundari, and Lakuta peoples. And often events are held every month. The objective is pretty simple. You just slam your opponent on the ground. Otherwise, South Sudan is known for a lot of other athletic accolades. In the 2016 Olympics, there were five South Sudanese athletes. Only five. They competed for the first time under the refugee Olympic team. Otherwise, it's well known that many of the South Sudanese diaspora in Australia have been drafted into oh, the wow. making a name for themselves. But That's if some good stuff for South Sudan. Put South Sudan on the map. It would probably be basketball. If there's one player that Manute everybody Bull. knows from South Whoa. Sudan in the NBA, that guy is so Manute Bull, tied for the tallest player ever in the NBA. Oh wow, he looks so the longest arm span in NBA history. He, he looks tall. One of the most imposing defensive players in the NBA. He set many block shot records and the only player in the NBA to have more. Damn, ah, look at his arm. Oh, that looks like he's the size of how tall I am. Bulbo actually followed in his footsteps and got recruited to the Miami Heat and then later to the Denver. Lucky guy got the genetic advantage. Yeah. Are you gonna carry on that uh, legacy? Not so bad. Dying expect. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Dying, uh, dying expectations, right? South Sudanese cultures on paper, 90% is really taught through spoken language and storytelling. Um, we want to unite everybody from South Sudan together and 
make it even stronger. That's the only way. Amen. You got to move forward it. together. Exactly. Well, there's so much to talk about the culture. So you know what? Let's just give Hannah a little bit of a rundown on the general culture of South Sudan. Hannah, take it away. All right. <laughs> So there are a ton of rules. Why is she pronouncing oil? Oil. Only one cultural experience, but there are some universal principles that everyone seems to adhere to. For one, similar to many nations in the area, age is very important. It's a really big no-no to insult an Ooh. elder, and if you do it, it's kind of like a curse. Often, cattle are considered a bigger form of wealth than actual oh, money or other commodities. Someone give me a <laughs> cow. In fact, it's actually kind of rare that the South Sudanese would eat cattle. The meat is usually reserved for a big occasion or for somebody really important who's visiting. Like in the Rwanda episode, South Sudanese will actually trade cattle during a marriage. It's like a cattle dowry tradition. And this is why bartering culture is really important and not just for marriage dowries. You can do it for pretty much anything. You can trade things for crops, labor, clothing, whatever. This is because most of the country operates under customary law. This is why social structures like marriages are addressed in the home, community, and tribal councils. Everywhere on the streets and walls, especially in Juba, you will see acrylic murals with a Yo, they are artists. Many are done by the Visual Art Association group Anataban. Anataban. You'll see hashtag Anataban on many of these murals. And speaking of art, there is an amazing story about South Sudan's film industry, starting with the Woyi film and TV industry, a group that was created out of a refugee camp, and now they no make movies way. in South Sudan. So if you want to learn more about that, follow me on Filmography Now. It's my new YouTube channel. Hannah has a spin off. She Hannah talks has about a film. Which brings us to Keith, who is actually. Wait, whoa, whoa. Come on, Keith. Moving to Los Angeles. Are we happy about it? Are we sad? Are you Come saying nothing's right? What? Wow. Keith. Hola! Yeah, he's the new tenant. Just so y'all know, uh, this is uh, a band from Sri Lanka. They're called Sri Now he's gonna be in every video. Sri he lives in she the house. Loves geography now, so she sent this shirt in. Woo! Drink. Root beer. It really is root beer, not real beer. Yes, root beer. And I'm back in hell <laughs> All right, South Sudan. Today, music is actually seeing a huge revival. During the years when they were under Sudan, especially in the 90s, much of the music tracks in the recordings were actually destroyed because Sudan actually wanted to promote- Ah, oh, come on, man. Time, some good quality films. That sidestepped the government restrictions. South Sudanese artists would intentionally mix- That looks like really good instruments. That looks pretty cool instruments. Overtly hide their meanings of their songs, and in 2005, these artists collaborated. This moment sparked a cultural milestone. From then, many notable artists have come out like these people. Even this one's known about making a song about big butts. I got one of those. I look forward to seeing many great artists in the future. If you know any more, write in the comments below. Oh, before I go, if you guys remember the South Africa yeah. episode, I talked about a song called Doof Doof by an artist named Synth Peter. He's got nominated to win essentially what is a Grammy Award for South Africa. No Cheers way. to you guys. I'm Keith, the real Florida man. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. All right, and with that, it's time to move on to our last segment, The Friends of South Sudan. Let's go. So South Sudan might be a new nation, but some of our diplomatic relationships go back thousands of years. So with South Sudan, upon their independence, many countries immediately decided to recognize them, including all members of the United Security Council, followed by admittance into many IGOs, such as the African Union, the East African Community, and weirdly enough, even the Arab League. However, there is currently a strong opposition to membership, since there is only a small Arab-speaking community, and also it kind of reminds them of their past. So. Yeah. The first country to recognize them, obviously, was their former ruler, Sudan. Today, relations with Sudan is kind of, uh, mm. interesting. Obviously, the war still has lasting ramifications on the way that they perceive Sudan today, and usually it's not the most favorable view, but more like a- Don't you just love the way that the top of Sudan but fits hey, in perfectly with the bottom? The like... new stuff comes in. As mentioned, the US and UK are the largest donors of oh, aid to South Sudan, and also hold the largest communities of South Sudanese people in diaspora outside of Africa, followed by Canada and Australia, most of whom as refugees Ooh during war times. In addition, South Sudan also applied to become a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. Speaking of which, India and Bangladesh have been key figures in their internal... Look at South Sudan doing bits! Like the first ever they really are progressing. ...happened in 2015, as Salva Kiir... There's Salva Kiir with the... ...with 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 the...
Bangladesh also had a hand as the Bangladesh Army Engineering Contingent was deployed to help construct and repair roadways post-war. Today, high-level delegates have also been sent to explore future investment opportunities, mostly in the agricultural field. When it comes to their closest friends, however, most South Sudanese people I have talked to will either say one of three East African nations, Ethiopia, Kenya, or Uganda. In addition to sharing some of the tribal overlap over the borders, all three of these nations took in the most refugees during war times, and many of the diaspora spent their whole lives generationally within them. Ethiopia played a huge role in helping with negotiations during the South Sudan Civil War in 2013, and peace agreements were signed here as well. In addition, Ethiopia always has their eye on South Sudan, as they are Nile River nations that have a huge impact on anything that eventually flows back up to Egypt. Kenya was one of the strongest supporters of their independence. Like Ethiopia, they acted as a mediator during conflict with Sudan, as the Machikos Protocol was signed here in 2002, creating a ceasefire. However, after that, they were always leaning with South Sudan all the way up to their independence in 2011. In addition, Kenya provides much of the financial support. Oh, look at Kenya supporting their neighbor. Much of their wood, and as mentioned before, is currently working on constructing pipelines to assist their oil industry, giving them access to the Damn, Indian Can you do this and that? Mullah! Then has become their largest import partner. South Sudan prefers to buy Ugandan produce more than any other nation, and a railway is currently underway to assist furthering trade. In addition, they have a very strong educational exchange, as many students study abroad in Uganda and complete their undergraduate or graduate studies here or in Kenya. Also, Uganda and Kenya send the most teachers over to South Sudan oh, to assist their shortage good. in the profession. Overall, together, these three countries Come on, guys, are unity. people for South Sudan that they can depend on and probably will for the foreseeable future. So, in conclusion, I'm going to give it to you. We come from such a beautiful country with a beautiful culture, with so much diversity within just one country. I agree. Damn, do you see that, that in South Sudan, bottom part of South Sudan? So many tribes. Interested or that want to make change. The only way to build the future is from the youth. My favorite thing about South Sudan is everyone is so united. It's like when you walk outside, everyone uh. is your family. It just everyone feels like home. It all feels like home. Thank you too. It's been awesome having you in the episode. Thank you so much for just sharing what you wanted to share about South Sudan. And with that, the next episode is going to be Suriname. Stay tuned. Wow, South Sudan seems like a really big family. If anything, I would I feel like Dom Toretto might be from South Sudan. You know, family is everything. <laughs> I've learned that South Sudanese people are passionate people. I've also learned that South Sudan can be basically broken up into three areas, you know, land of the gazelles, then river Nile, and the uh, one bit, I keep forgetting the name of it, but yeah, um, and it's very diverse. What I take away from that is that it's got a lot of tribes inside of it, a lot of tribes. <laughs> Honestly, I am looking forward to the development that South Sudan can potentially have and what it can do. Right now that it's got its independence, I'm quite happy about it. I, I'm not too sure about the politics and what has happened and uh, what is gonna happen, but I really do hope that the cowboy guy really pushes for a great like land. That is all for my video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to l drop it. Just drop a subscribe button. Just, just go to the subscribe button. You know, just try that. Just try that. Uh, and also make sure to like it to support my channel. Thank you guys for watching. That is all for today. Catch you on the next video. Major out.